let's go to the word of god if you've been following our uh, sunday teaching you know that now we should go to mark chapter 13 because that's our next passage we have concluded mark chapter 12 so usually i would just uh, select the next passage in line and next paragraph or so and read it and then explain it and apply it but today i'm not going to do that but i want you to turn to mark 13 i want you to just glance at it i want to introduce mark 13 to you i want to introduce this to you mark 13 is a different kind of a chapter and so i think it's better to approach it differently mark 13 is labeled as the most difficult chapter to understand in the book of mark by the scholars the biblical scholars would say this is the most difficult chapter to understand what is mark 13 about mark 13 is about jesus's teaching concerning the end times the teaching that jesus gave about end times to his disciples that's what mark 13 is if you notice in mark 13 the disciples ask a question in verse 4 the disciples ask a question the question is if i want to put it simply i'll say end times but it's a complicated question next week i'll show you the complexity of the question itself so the question is raised in verse 4 by the disciples and then jesus begins answering their question from verse 5 all the way to the end of the chapter if their question is complicated jesus's answer is much more <laughs> complex you cannot say it's a easy to understand passage see not all passages in the bible are easy to understand right there are passages in the bible that are some are more difficult to understand than others and this is one such passage there are complexities to it there are nuances to it and there are uncertainties there are varying interpretations and so on and so forth and uh, I think we need to approach it carefully with humility and uh, in all kinds there is a right approach and there is a wrong approach to it and I don't think it is wise to just jump into this chapter today and directly start dealing with the specific teaching found here I say that because the Bible has many things to say about the end times that are clear that are clear see there are some passages that are sort of you know people interpret it differently and there's some disagreement this way that way right i'm talking about end times teaching okay when it comes to end times teaching there are some passages that some people say mean this other people say it means that but the main things about the end times the bible teaches very clearly the main things pretty much there's no dispute about it it's pretty clear one preacher put it like this the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things that's useful remember that the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things in other words what is clearly revealed about end times in the bible is the main thing what is a little obscure perhaps what's a little more complicated is this is a general rule is usually not as main is not as important the most important things are revealed clearly in the bible this is a general rule now there may be exceptions to it but generally speaking the most important things are revealed clearly crystal clear in the bible there is no dispute about it no disagreement about it and it is important to first get the important things <laughs> it is important to first understand the important things <laughs> to first pay attention to the plain things because they are the main things you know if you don't have the right foundation the building itself will shake you know that right if you go to this kind of passage without the right foundation i don't believe it will be useful for you i don't believe it's a good approach first of all you need to know the foundational truths the basic truths about what the bible teaches regarding end times the basics i am talking the most important things okay the most foundational things the basic stuff you need to first remind yourself of that you need to understand that you need to be clear about that before you move on to some of the more complicated stuff otherwise it's simply not wise you you'll just get into trouble you'll trip up over many things in this passage you don't go and jump in the deep end of the pool usually right 
Most people don't go directly jump in the deep end of the pool. You know, the swimming pool, it starts from like three feet, four feet, and then ends up nine feet, ten feet, fifteen feet. Most people, I don't say go jump in directly in the deep end. Most people like to get down here. First, get accustomed to the water, you know, the temperature. And especially if you don't know swimming too good, don't get in that side. Get in this side. Maybe learn some swimming this side and then go and try it out that side. You know what I mean? If you don't know multiplication, if you don't know addition, if you don't know 2 plus 2, you don't go start learning about calculus. You know what I mean? Addition, multiplication is the most important, it's the most basic. You can survive, you can make it in this world without calculus. Yeah? I don't know if you can make it without addition and multiplication. It's like that. In the Bible, there are some things that are main, plain, most important, foundational. You cannot survive without that. I mean, literally, you'd be lost without it. Literally, you would perish without it. <laughs> but there are other things that you can survive without. <laughs> Maybe, you know, you lose out on a little bit here and there, but you can make it without it. So it's like that. And so my concern is, as we get into this chapter, I feel like in a church like ours, with the congregation that we have, because we have a number of people, there may always be people that need the foundational teaching, that need the foundational. We cannot just assume that everybody's on the same page and they know the basic stuff, the most important stuff. The basic stuff is the most important stuff. I think people go wrong there. It's a, they think basic is not important. No, no, basic only is most important. Basic only can make the most difference, actually. Okay. So I cannot assume that everybody knows the most important teachings about end times that the Bible gives. And so I have to try to carry along everybody. My responsibility is not just to teach people who know things. My responsibility is to teach the basic, most important truths to the people of God here. And so I want to do that. So I ask you to bear with me. Those of you who feel like some of the things I'm sharing today are so basic, are so Sunday schoolish, are so elementary, I ask you to please bear with me because it's needed for others, it's good for others, and also it's good for you. Let's test your patience a little bit. Your patience is a Christian virtue, needs to grow. How is it going to grow? It has to be tested. And so maybe here's an opportunity for it to grow. <laughs> All right, so it's good for everybody in the end. Let's begin. So today, I'm not going to go into Mark 30. I'm not going to read the chapter. I'm not going to read a passage. I'm not going to directly tackle that. Rather, what I'm going to give you is the basics of the Christian view regarding the end times. The basics of the Christian view regarding the end times. I believe this will be a useful introduction so that we can enter Mark chapter 13 next week. Okay? We can start thinking about it with the most important stuff. All right. Number one, the basics of the Christian perspective when it comes to end times. I want to give it in five points with applications for each point, okay? First, number one, the world is coming to an end. So start thinking about it. <laughs> There's the first point. Simple enough, yeah? The world is coming to an end, so you better start thinking about it. The world as we know it, life as we know it, is coming to an end. We have to start thinking about it. If I jump into Mark 13 and people are not even thinking about it, people don't even want to think about it, it's going to be totally, it's not going to connect, it's not going to make sense. So I want to say today, let's at least start thinking about it. The world is coming to an end. Start thinking about it. I say that because many people are not thinking about it. And in the busyness of life also, we kind of just neglect it also, right? Practically, we don't think about it or we are in, some people are in denial almost, you know, they live as though it's not true. Some don't even really accept it. They, you know, have other theories. Like for example, some people believe that the world will never come to an end, so to speak. It will just go round and round. Like some people's view of history, right, in our part of the world sometimes is a cyclical view where basically history repeats itself, what goes around comes around, pretty much we go in circles. Now that's true on a certain level. But what they're saying is, it'll never end, it'll just keep going like this, from cycle to cycle, so you live your life, and then you come to the end of your life, and then you die, 
and then you're reincarnated as something else and then you start another cycle. Then you enter another cycle and from one cycle to the next we keep going with no end in sight. This is how it is. Well, the Bible disagrees. <laughs> the Bible says, no, the world had a definite point of beginning and it will have a definite point of ending. This world as we know it will come to an end and then there is a forever. There is a different kind of world which is forever. This existence will come, this kind of existence will come to an end and there is a different and better existence after that for some but different and worse for some. <laughs> different existence forever. This is the Bible view. Yeah, we acknowledge that history repeats itself, certainly. There are repeating patterns. People keep sinning. God keeps showing mercy. <laughs> repeating pattern. But if you want to zoom out and look at history, there is a linear progression. It's a step-by-step -step linear. It's not a cyclical view. It's a linear progression. There was a definite point when the world began. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's a definite point. Creation. Everybody say creation. That's your beginning. Then fall. The world fell. God created a good world, but then man, due to man's sin, the world, this good world fell. It's referred to as the fall. Then you have redemption. That's the next stage where God comes from heaven and does something about this fall to redeem man from this fall, you know. Jesus comes and lives and dies and rises again. That's redemption. And then the last stage is glorification. That is Whatever Jesus paid the price for, we begin to experience it now, but not in its fullness. That we have to wait for the glorification. Now the foretaste, then the fullness. So, creation, fall, redemption, glorification. Every person should know this. Last year in VBS, I taught it to 12 standard students. You should know it. There is a clear stages, right? So everybody say creation, fall, redemption, glorification. Now where are we living between redemption and glorification? Which means we can begin to experience the blessings of God more and more and more. But the fullness and the climactic manifestation and the fullness of it is yet to come when God glorifies us and the world. So there are stages and it's progressing. First there is a regression but then there is a progression and it's not a cyclical view. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible's view is not so strange. Even science says that uh, they even they think the world will end. Most of them at least. They point to the second law of thermodynamics entropy and such explanations and they refer to something called the heat death of the universe. There are various theories. But I'm just saying, even they acknowledge that everything has an expiry date. You know, everything comes to an end. It just makes sense, doesn't it? You go to school, school life comes to an end, right? Then you go to college, then college comes to an end. Then you go to work, then work comes to an end, doesn't it? Then you go into retirement and then retirement also comes to an end. Just like people don't think about the end of their life, they don't think about the end of the world also. Most people don't even think about the end of their life. Their life is going to end. They know it, but they don't think about it. They live almost in denial, just putting off thinking about it, planning for it, preparing for it. I don't think that's very smart. People think, you think about the end of life uh, when you get old, you know, go into your 70s or 80s or whatever, you know. That's when you have to think. Of. No, I don't think that's very smart. Even in the world, if you look at uh, some of these worldly guys, they're in their 20s and they're saying, I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 50 and retire. I'm talking about 20-year-olds talking like this. I want to be a millionaire by the time I'm 40 or 50 and then retire, right? Now, maybe they don't have the right view of money or different things, but I at least appreciate their pre-planning. <laughs> that part of their thing has to be appreciated. Most people in their 20s don't think, you know, so far ahead. But they're saying, by this stage, I want to be here so that, you know, I'll be prepared for this stage, you know. Most people don't think about the future. The long, they're just living in the present, not thinking about the future. How foolish it would be if there's a forever, if there's an eternity after this life and after this world, and we don't even think about it. That's the most foolish thing, to have an eternity and not think about it. Now, some people, of course, don't believe in eternity. They believe this is all there is, the here and now, that's it, done, 
Really? Does that make sense to you? This is all there is? Again, it doesn't make sense to me. What you do in school affects your college admission, right? What you do in school affects your college, right? What you do in college affects your work, right? What you do in work affects your retirement, right? It all counts for the future, doesn't it? Does it? Yeah. Everything you do seems to count in the next step. Doesn't it make sense that your whole life taken as a whole then counts for something? It's just common sense. Every single stage seems to make a difference to the next stage. If that is true, all the stages put together, life itself surely must make some kind of a difference for what is coming after. If it doesn't, then this whole thing becomes meaningless. This life itself becomes meaningless. What you do now doesn't matter. But the Bible says, no, it does matter. What you do right now counts forever. One preacher put it like that. Right now counts forever. Because there is a forever. We better start thinking about it. That's my first point. Second, let's think about it. Let's live as though it is true. Because they know. See, there are even Christians sometimes. They know the world is coming to an end. Jesus is returning. Uh, there's a new heavens and a new earth. There's, there's all this coming. They know that, but they don't live as though it's true. They don't live as though it's true. They live as though it's not true. So they live as though all there is to existence is go to work and come. Their work is the main thing. Or for some people, the family is the main thing. Now those are important things. Work is very important. Family is very important. But is it the main thing? In your eternity, is that going to be the main thing? Is that forever going to be like this? So you have to think. See, here we are born, we grow up, go to school, study, go to college, get a job, get married, have children, raise a family, raise the children, send them out, then we retire, then we, you know. So this is the progression of life here. I'm asking, is it going to be like this in the next stage? Have we thought about that? What is going to be most important in that stage? See, we need to start thinking about it. We need to start living now as though that is true. If we really believe it's true. Like right now counts forever. So secondly, so that's first. This world is going to end. So let's start thinking about it. Secondly, this world is going to end the way God wants it to end. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about it. All we have to do is trust him. This world is going to end the way God wants it to end. So we don't have to worry. Just trust in him. Or I'll put it in a different way. The second point I'll put in a different way. God is sovereign and so he will fulfill his purpose in the end. So don't worry, just trust him. Now listen to those words carefully. God is sovereign and so he will fulfill his purpose in the end. So you don't have to worry, just trust him. Just trust him. Say, so God is sovereign. What does that mean? God rules and reigns over all. Everything is in his control. That's what sovereign means. Everything is in his control. He has all power and supreme authority. That is, he can do what he wants and he has the right to do what he wants. Combine the two, you got a sovereign person, a ruler. <laughs> if you can do what you want and you have the right to do whatever you want, boy, that's ultimate power. Belongs to God. He can do what he wants and he has the right to do whatever he wants wants. He is all-powerful, supremely in authority. Nobody else has that kind of power, ultimate power and authority like him. You know. Nobody can challenge his power and authority. Not the greatest of men, not the greatest kings and rulers. He installs kings and he removes kings. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> So I know we're impressed with the great authority figures and rulers in the world, but lift up your eyes and look beyond that. The great sovereign one is above all. None can challenge his authority, not men, not nature. Nature, people are scared of nature, but God is sovereign over nature. He rules nature. Yeah, I know when the flood comes, it is scary for us. When the cyclone hits, it's scary. When the tsunami hits, it's scary. And the earthquakes happen, it's scary. But, you know, we have to remind ourselves that God rules over them all. He parts the sea at will. 
If he wants, he just parts the sea, he just suspends the laws of nature. He put it in place, he suspends it. He calms the storm with one word. He walks on the sea. If there's no boat, he says, well, fine, let me just walk, you know. You got to get there. He has no limitations and uh, nothing can stop him. Everything has to submit to him. He rules and reigns over all, even evil forces. See, I'm saying all this because when it comes to end times, you know very well. People who know Bible know, even people who watch end times movies, you know. Even they know. When it comes to end times, there's going to be wars. <laughs> there's going to be rumors of wars, earthquakes, and uh, famine, right? And uh, the devil is also working, doing this and that. So what is our approach when we hear about all these things? Oh, the earthquakes is not happening. Famine is happening. You know, wars are happening. This empire is coming up. This empire is going down. What is our approach? Are we standing there all fearful, afraid? No, 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 no. We remind ourselves that God is above them all, above these natural disasters and above these empires and above all of it, even the devil. The devil is under his feet. The devil is under the feet of Jesus. If Jesus has to speak to the devil, he has to speak like this, you know. If the devil has to look up, he has to look up like this to Jesus. He's sovereign. He rules over all. And so we refuse to be afraid. We say, no, I don't have to fear this because God rules over all these things. See, that is in the mind of Jesus. I'll show you in Mark 13. When you look at Mark 13 in the next few weeks, you will see that the teaching of Jesus is very pastoral here. He has a concern for his disciples. He says in verse 7, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. <laughs> do not be. Don't be alarmed, he says. Huh? There will be, if you continue reading verse 8, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, or there will be earthquakes in various places, there will be famines. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> All these things will happen. Why you don't be alarmed? You know that your God is above it all and rules and reigns over all. Nothing is outside his control and the world is going to end how he wants it to end. You just trust in him. I don't care what the devil does. He cannot ultimately mess up God's plan. He cannot ultimately destroy God's plan. God will fulfill his purpose in the end how many of you think God has some purposes see God can do what he wants God has the right to do whatever he wants and he wants some things for this world God wants some things God has some definite goals for this world do you know that some people Think of God as, a, you know, they believe there is a God and all that, but they think he's uninvolved. You know, practically, that's how they approach life. Ah, there's a God, he's out there somewhere, but their approach is he created the world, you know, put laws into motion and then left it there and he's attending to something else, you know. He's not very interested in the daily affairs of the world. No, 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 that's not the, that's not the idea of God in the Bible. I saw a poster today in our children's church in the first floor. For the children, they've put up something there. It says, not my idea of God but God. Not my idea. He is not who I think he is. He is. <laughs> we better match up to get the right idea. You know, Our ideas are wrong. He is fully involved and he, yes, he gave the authority to man and yes, man messed it up and yes, uh, those complications are there. Yes, the devil is there but God is above all. Even above man. Yes, God is the one who gave authority to man, but yet God is above man. He is the supreme ruler. And so we remind ourselves of this. God can do what he wants. God has the right to do whatever he wants. And God wants some things and the world is going to end the way he wants it. That it's going to end the time he wants it to end. It's going to end the way he wants it to end. Nobody can change that. No nation, no empire, no nothing. It's going to end the time he wants it to end. It's going to end the way he wants it to end. His purposes will be fulfilled. Do you believe that? I know that you can do all things, Job said. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job 42 verse 2. Do you believe that? 
That's what I'm saying. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Psalm 135, 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, that he does in heaven, in earth, in the seas, and in all the deep places. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does everywhere, anywhere. Nobody can stop him. Is your God that big? Is your idea of God that big? Because God is that big at least. What I'm saying is, when we have this basic truth down, right, we will not be afraid when we hear about all the evil that may happen or whatever, you know, the natural disasters, whatever, all these things. We should not be alarmed. Jesus says, do not be alarmed. Do not be alarmed. Just realize that God is in control and God has a plan and it's going to go according to his plan. Just like the cross went according to his plan, the end will go according to his plan. And actually, you know, timing, exact events, disasters, you don't have to worry about all that. But some people are worried, some people are in the busy business of predicting the exact timing and all that. But actually only God knows. Actually only God knows. But uh, throughout uh, history, there are pe people who have predicted Jesus will return on this date. This will, you know, they've predicted the end of... Uh, um, it's okay to generally say some things, but to say this day, this, uh, you know, hour like that is... Uh, I don't know how they get that kind of confidence. In one level, I kind of admire their confidence, but in one level, it is very foolish, I think. Verse 32 says in Mark 13, Mark 13, verse 32 says, But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Mark 13, 32, that is. Concerning that day or hour, <laughs> when Jesus will return, no one knows, only the Father. But I, then I don't know how some people know. But and they're very confident also. You know, that's why I said, I, I kind of, in one sense, I admire their confidence. I'm, I'm stunned. No, God knows. It's going to happen when He wants it to happen. It's going to happen the way He wants it to happen. I don't know these things. I don't have to know these things because I know Him. Because I know. I know the one who knows that is enough. I trust Him because He is my Father. Can you say that about yourself? You don't have to know the future. You know the one who holds the future in His hands. Just trust him. He's sovereign. He'll work his purpose out in the end. It's like a child doesn't understand all that the father is doing, but the child trusts. It knows, oh, it's my father. He won't do anything wrong to me, you know. He'll make sure I'm okay. I don't get all that he's doing, you know. I'm sure my children don't understand all that I'm doing. Some of what I'm doing doesn't make any bit of sense to them, you know. They think I'm, you know. <laughs> Just think about it from a perspective of a child. <laughs> Some things look totally strange. But the child knows when it comes to them, I won't hurt them, I won't harm them. Ultimately, I'll do things for their good. If a child can place so much trust in an earthly father, how much more we can place in our? Just trust him. You don't have to understand everything, just trust him. See, the sovereignty and all, you may have questions, you may have objections. I understand that. For example, God is sovereign even over evil. <laughs> that doesn't mean he's the doer of evil. He's not the perpetrator of evil. He's not the reason for evil. He is the fountain of good. <laughs> He's the source of goodness. Every good thing comes from him. He does not do evil, only good. But guess what? Even evil is under his control. If it's not, how can he turn evil into good? <laughs> for him to turn evil into good, evil also has to be only under his sovereignty. He has to rule. He rules evil. He doesn't do evil, but he rules evil. Now that's hard to understand, especially for people going through evil. Especially if evil is happening to you, that you cannot understand that. But I say, on the basis of the word of God, believe it. You don't have to understand everything. You have to believe. And the more you believe, the more you will understand. I don't know if Joseph understood God's sovereignty when he was in the pit. <laughs> I don't know if Joseph understood God's sovereignty when they sold him as a, when his own family threw him in the pit, sold him as a slave, like an animal, you know. And then when he was accused of rape, 
and thrown in jail. And the whole thing, he didn't really do anything wrong. You know? He didn't do anything wrong, sinful, no. In fact, he stood for righteousness. When all that happened, I don't think Joseph had a great understanding of God's sovereignty. He might have had a thousand questions. How can all these things happen? I didn't do anything wrong, but I'm being punished. But I think Joseph believed in God's sovereignty. When you look at his life trajectory, when you see all that evil happening to him, yet he seems to have a motivation to keep living. Where did that come from? The guy is accused of rape, thrown in jail unjustly, and he gets up in jail every day, does his job, you know, does whatever duty is given to him so that they make him like the you know, leader there. <laughs> they give him a leadership role there. You know, when bad things are happening to you, it's difficult to just get up and go to work and do your job properly, isn't it? You need a kind of thing that keeps you stable, you know. He seems to have had that through all the evil happening. I think he believed in the sovereignty of God. I don't understand it all, but I know my God is above all. He gave me a dream and one day that dream, he will fulfill it. That's it. I think he believed it. That's the only way to keep living like the way he did, you know. Only if he believed in that dream and the God who gave him that dream, he could keep going through the midst of all that, never give up. And we know what happened in the end. Joseph, he becomes prime minister of Egypt. And then right at the end, you know, when it all works out in his favor, he then seems to really understand. He says, what you intended for evil, my God intended for good, right? Genesis 50. I say don't expect to understand everything, just believe it, it's okay. Why should you believe it if you say, how can I believe it if I don't understand? Why not? The word says so. You believe the word, right? It's the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible clearly teaches this. How many times it says, the Lord reigns, the Lord reigns. The <laughs> so believe what the Bible says. One great theologian said it this way. Theology is faith seeking understanding. Faith seeking understand. That means if you want to study God, you want to study about God and get to know Him, you have to come with faith in order to understand. <laughs> Only if you have some starting faith, you can understand more. If you come totally not believing God and believing anything about God, it's very difficult to actually understand. Faith seeking understanding, that is the task of theology, the effort to study God. What does that look like? You're already believing and you come and you want to understand more. So the more you believe, the more you will understand. And the more you understand, the more you will believe. All I'm saying is just a trust in God's sovereignty and don't worry. Everybody say, don't worry. Trust God. <laughs> you have to apply this to end times matters. Instead of sitting there worrying about all this stuff that's happening. No, I, I trust God, right? Because history is in his hands. The future is in his hands. Thirdly, so first, the world is coming to an end. Think about it. Secondly, it's going to end the way God wants it to end. So don't worry. Sit back. Trust him. <laughs> All right? Trust him. Thirdly, the key to God's plan for the world is Jesus Christ. So pay attention to him. The key to God's plan for the world is Jesus Christ. I said God has a plan. I said, you know, God wants some things about the world. He's not an uninvolved God. He has a goal. God is not operating without a goal, without a purpose, you know. Like some people, you know, sometimes in life people live aimlessly, right. You ask them, what do you want to achieve? They don't know, right. That's common for everybody. Sometimes everybody goes through that stages. But it's so important to have a goal in life, to have a purpose in life, to have an aim in life. You're studying, what's your aim? What's your goal, you know? You have to have a goal for career. You have to have a goal for very... Even you came to church today, you have to have some goals. Why do I have to go to church? For this. You know, these goals I should try to, you know, reach. <laughs> these aims, these purposes. Why go to church? There are some clear purposes. <laughs> but sometimes people just go about things aimlessly. Go to work aimlessly, study aimlessly, go about their career aimlessly, even go to church aimlessly. <laughs> Just go through it. God is not like that. He is a purposeful God. He has plans. He has definite plans. And he has even revealed them in the scriptures. And all his plans for the world center around Jesus Christ. 
see, in football, you have a goal. The goal is to go score the goal, you know. God is trying to move history towards a certain goal. And what is that goal? Does the Bible say anything about it? It does. Let me read Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Ephesians 1. God has a goal for the world. The way it should end. Now, you should not go into end times thing without understanding that, you know, kind of having a basic understanding that basically God's purposes revolve around Jesus Christ. He's the center of his purposes, basically. And that's expressed in this passage, Ephesians 1, 9, 10. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Paul is saying God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose. What is that uh, mystery? What is his will that God has now revealed? Verse 10. It's a plan for the fullness of time means when time reaches its fullness, when time reaches its climactic moment as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Unite all things in him. Things in heaven and in whom? In Christ. What's the goal? One goal clearly expressed is God in the fullness of time, wants to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Everybody say all things. United in Christ. Yeah, to unite all things in Christ. Yeah. Or to Christ, you can take it like that, but it says in him. Yeah. So the goal is to bring everything and everyone to Christ. Christ is the center of uh, uh, his plan. Think about it. There's no other person who's central, who's prominent in the beginning, middle, and end of the world. There is no other person who is prominent in the beginning, in the middle, and the end of the world. In the beginning, Jesus Christ is prominent. Why? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Everything was made through Him. Nothing was made that was not made without Him. In the beginning, it says it is through Jesus that the world was made. He's prominent, he's important there. And then in the middle, 2,000 years ago, Jesus enters this world, lives a stellar life, and then suffers and dies and then rises again, the Bible says. And he's the most important person in the, in the history of the whole world, according to the way we date history itself, B.C. and A.D., before Christ, and then after, right? Now, of course, some people recently didn't like that practice. They said, ah, we shouldn't call it before Christ. Isn't that amazing that history itself is now centered, the way you date something is you say B.C. or A.D. It's in reference to Jesus Christ. But some people don't like to give him that due. And so they say, well, let's just change it around a little bit. Let's not call it B.C. anymore. Let's call it B.C.E., you know, before the common era, and then CE, the common era. <laughs> so they changed the name. But guess what? The time is still the same. He's the one who divides it still. They just, it's his time. It's his entry. It's his life. It's his death and resurrection. That still is the same reference point. They just want to call it differently because they don't want to give him his, you know, they don't want to acknowledge his name. <laughs> Strange. But he has still divided history. <laughs> it looks like that's going to stay. He's the, he's the middle of history. He's the most prominent person in history. And in the end, he's the one who's going to bring this world to an end and bring into being the new world. When he returns only, this world will be brought to a close and the new world will come into being. Notice he's prominent in everything. For God, his son is the main thing, <laughs> you know. But then, where are we? Well, if you look at his son, through his son, you can see our prominence <laughs> in the mind and the plan and the heart of God. Jesus Christ lived a stellar life. I don't think you can find anybody else who has the combination that Jesus has of a spotless character 
and then unlimited power he seems to be able to do whatever he wants you know raise the dead walk on the water at least that's what the bible says and i go with the bible you know so this report of a a person having this kind of a spotless character challenging people to point out his sin is sinless it seems like and he has great power to do miracles and all kinds of and then he teaches the highest kinds of teaching the greatest wisdom this combination can you find anywhere else <laughs> spotless character unlimited power seems like it and uh, this kind of a uh, superb teaching he lives that kind of life and then he goes dies that kind of death that's also very unique a person like him to die that kind of horrible death and everybody knows not just the bible everybody knows that he didn't die for his sin <laughs> because they know he lived as almost you know at least even in the eyes of the world he lived a spotless life we would say he lived a spotless life that's what the, i'm talking from the world's perspective even they acknowledge that he lived a stellar life and he did not deserve that death then why did he die like that was it one great big tragedy the bible says no he died for our sins he died for our sins that's the only satisfactory explanation for jesus's death he died for our sins my sin my curse was placed upon him and the sins of the world and the curse that is due upon mankind was placed on him and he bore it all so that human beings can be freed from sin freed from cursed existence and enter into a blessed existence from now until forever you know in the new heavens and the new earth there is not going to be any evil right there's not going to be any suffering there's not going to be any pain all that yeah you know all that but you know where that comes from the price for that was paid on the cross <laughs> you have to connect that new heavens and new earth world free of pain and suffering and sin all the way to the cross if he hadn't died for us borne our sin borne our curse that's not the world we get in the end a different world is what is reserved <laughs> only because he died and bore our sin and curse we in the end get a perfect world free of pain suffering and sin and now itself we get a foretaste of that perfect world what i'm saying is just because we're talking about the end times doesn't mean we should forget jesus he is the center of god's plan beginning middle and end we have to always keep coming back to jesus pay attention to him that's why we are teaching the gospel of mark remember the whole reason we got into this series is so that we can focus on jesus because people think that you know sometimes christians think that uh, you start with jesus and then you go on to something higher more advanced no they think jesus is the way and then jesus is the door so you go through him enter the door and then you forget about him you know you go on to more advanced and greater and higher things no no there is nothing higher he is the way he is the door he is the truth he is the life he is god's wisdom the depth of god's wisdom is him the heights of god's wisdom is him you know in the christian life it is always important to focus on jesus because god's plan for the world centers around jesus christ <laughs> from beginning to and his plan centers around him so if we've got any sense we will have a focus on him in the end he's the one who's going to bring this world to a close and bring in this a new world so the question becomes then uh, do you know this jesus <laughs> if he's the key in god's plan do you know him do you uh, believe him do you follow him do you have a relationship with him are you close to him if he's the most central person if he's the most important person not just in history but in god's plan and even for the end my question is do you know him how's your relationship with him because the fourth point is this same jesus christ will return gloriously in the end to judge the world the same jesus christ who came 2000 years ago is going to return gloriously in the end to judge the world are you ready to face him <laughs> are you ready to face him now this is a very most important question jesus will return jesus is going to come back 
the bible teaches that around 300 times in the new testament or in the bible in various forms he will return physically he will return literally he will return visibly he will return personally and he will return gloriously i say all that because some people will will just try to fiddle with this and say well the spirit of jesus will return the spirit of jesus is teaching and his what he was really after that will will come no 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 he will return he will return physically literally it will be the lord jesus christ in his glorious body and people will see him acts 111 says you know when when jesus ascended to heaven uh, the disciples were standing in awe like that acts chapter 1 verse 9 onwards you read they just dumbfounded you know just looking at him kind of gloriously going away and the angels there are telling them acts 111 they said you men of galilee why are you standing gazing up to heaven this same jesus who is taken up from you into heaven shall come in like manner just as you saw him go into heaven the same jesus who is being taken up from you into heaven will return in a similar manner just like you saw him go into heaven well what is that manner mark 13 our passage itself jesus himself says how he will return gloriously and he describes it in this way mark 13 verse 24 onwards he says but in those days after that tribulation the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light think about that when you read the bible you have to stop and imagine eh? the sun will be darkened have you ever seen that the moon will be darkened no light and then 25 the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken this is uh, not like how jesus came the first time you know born a baby in a manger quietly uh, quietly not disturbing many people just like that you know no no this coming of jesus is going to be a glorious one when he returns in the end it will be a glorious coming heaven and earth will be shaken heavens will be shaken it says the powers in the heavens are shaken in his birth it looked like a star was leading them to the place of his birth when he returns stars will be falling from heaven and then comes his uh, appearance 26 and then they will see the son of man coming in clouds with great power and glory so it's like when the darkness is at its worst sun giving no light moon done now the son of man appears the greatest brilliance of light the one who shines brighter than the sun appears in the context of that darkness they will see the son of man they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and glory everybody say they shall see that means the world will see the son of man coming in the clouds If you know Old Testament, nobody else comes in the clouds except Yahweh. If he's coming in the clouds, it's Yahweh. He rides the clouds like it's his chariot, you know. Everybody will see Jesus coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Everybody say great power and glory. It's a glorious return in the end. He will return gloriously. That's amazing. That's amazing. you believe that jesus will return in the end gloriously to judge the world to judge the... so get this right so when he lived in his in his earthly life he hid his glory yeah i know people put a halo on top of jesus head in paintings and all when he's doing a miracle or whatever but he had no halo he looked like an ordinary man he looked like an ordinary man but he did extraordinary things but in the end he will appear gloriously his true glory will be seen even on the outside if you can just imagine that eh, the one who created the sun moon and the stars shining brighter than the sun before whom the apostle john fell down flat as if he was dead when he saw the glory of jesus he couldn't take it this glorious jesus will return and then he will judge the world this is the end now this is most important no point talking about end times 
if we don't realize that Jesus is returning gloriously and every single person has to stand before him in judgment. The Bible teaches that. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 2. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 2. Paul says to Timothy, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Look at how he calls Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Jesus will return gloriously and judge the living and the dead. The living and the dead. Huh. Revelation 20, 11 to 15, you know, is a great uh, judgment passage. Then I saw a great white throne, him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Revelation 20, 11 to 15. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Everyone must stand before Jesus the judge. <laughs> judge Jesus. Jesus the judge. <laughs> I don't know if we've thought about him in that way, right? <laughs> we think of Jesus as sweet Jesus, savior Jesus, shepherd Jesus, you know, high priest Jesus. How about Jesus the judge of the living and the dead? The Jesus, the glorious judge before whom every human will stand and give account. One person describes it like this, you know, when human beings are awaiting the judgment and they're thinking, who's going to judge them? What's going to happen? And in walks this man. <laughs> in walks this man. Maybe if God judged, and he tries to explain, you know, why God gave the judgment to Jesus. The father hands over the judgment responsibility to the son. And he says, maybe if God judged, we would give excuses. We would say, God, you know, you don't know what it's like to be a man, you know. What do you know about our struggles? You didn't walk on the same earth and go through the same struggles and the pain and the suffering and the temptation. What do you know, God? You know, you're up here, you're great, but we, you know, this was tough for us. No, that excuse won't work. <laughs> because the person, the judge before us would be not only God, but man who uh, walked on the same earth went through the same kind of struggles. In fact, worse suffering, worst suffering. And the Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are. Think about that. Tempted in every way like us, yet without sin. So we're going to have to give account to a person who went through everything we went through but lived a perfect life. Have you ever faced a judge like that? This is tough. <laughs> Judges in this world, you know, are very responsible and often very great people, but nobody's perfect. But here is a perfect, spotless judge. What standard do you think he will expect in the judgment? <laughs> I think when you ask somebody, are you ready for the judgment? What will you say, you know? If somebody stops you at the gate of heaven and says, why should we let you in? You know, what will you say? You know, people mouth off all these answers, right? You know, like I'll say that, you know, I did so many works of charity. I'll say that, you know, I was born and brought up in a church and went all my life and I did so much for the church and God knows it. And they, they say all these things, right? But I don't think they realize, I don't think they've actually thought it through. When you stand before the glorious judge, Will you really be able to open your mouth and say, here are the good things I did, you know, before the perfect one, before the one who's spotless, sinless, who did not commit one act of sin, think one thought of sin, have one desire of sin. Do you think we can stand before him and Make a list of our, you know, the list that we have looked so petty before him. 
the works of charity we did, is it really enough? Does that cut it? Does that give, come up to the pass mark? People have all kinds of notions, but I feel like when they actually stand before Jesus, the glorious judge, most people, you know, when you say, how do you know you're going to heaven? They say, well, I was born and brought up in a Christian family. For gen 10 generations, we're Christian. You know, we were the one who built the church, led the church, this, that, and the other, right? People who answer like that. Or people who say out in the world, you know, well, here are my works of charity. Here are my good deeds. I've done so many. These outweigh my bad deeds. They, they say it like that here. But before him, when they see his glory, when they see his perfection, when they see his perfect track record, and when they realize that it is him who gave them life and breath and everything and talents and abilities, and yet they've gone against him. They've lived their lives against him. Yeah, it may be some few works of charity here. When, when you look at it, you know what I mean? <laughs> when you look at the most glorious sight, the list you have is so petty. People will find out one day when it's too late. And I think most of them will be speechless. I think these people who say, oh, I'll just give him my list of good deeds, I think they will be speechless before him. I think even some people who call themselves Christians, but they're saying, oh, I'll tell them how I for every week I went to church and, and this is my criteria for getting into heaven, you know. I'm a Christian by birth, a Christian by growth, and Christian by <laughs> name, and Christian by membership, and <laughs> all these things. These people who are proud about that, before him they'll be speechless because they will realize they have sinned and fallen short. Are you ready to face him in judgment? I think there's only one way to face him. That's what the Bible teaches. <laughs> See, some people are so confident. Ah, oh, yeah, I'll go to heaven. But actually, they won't. <laughs> okay. Some people are not confident, but they will. Now, I don't think both are ideal. <laughs> you want to be confident that you'll go and actually go. That's ideal. But I, I told you about the ones who are confident sometimes, out in the world or in the church even, but they won't. There is another group that is not confident. They are fearful. They are afraid. They are terrified at the thought of meeting Jesus because they know their sin. They know their shortcomings. They are terrified. But I think some of them will go only. Because you know why? Because they are trusting Jesus. <laughs> Even though their trust is not perfect, their knowledge is not perfect, they, they haven't really got it enough to have that stable trust. But they're trusting Jesus, you know. You ask them, why should we admit you into heaven? And they'll say, oh, I'm actually a sinner on my record, but Jesus, you died for me. That's the answer you want. That's the answer you want. Jesus, you died for me. Jesus, you bore my sin. You paid the price for my sin. See, that's the answer. When you stand before glorious judge Jesus, the only thing you can open your mouth and say is, why should I get in? <laughs> Lord, you died for me. If that is not enough, <laughs> what is? <laughs> I'm a sinner. I was your enemy. I don't deserve nothing good. But you paid the price for my sin. You went through the most horrible death for me. This glorious one went through the worst suffering. So that this worst one can become glorious. It's not enough if you have confidence about the end. Where is your confidence placed in? It's not enough if you're confident, yeah, I'll go to heaven. Some people, like, some people are confident, they won't go. Some people are not confident, they will go. It's not enough to have confidence. The question is, where is your confidence? If your confidence is in your church membership, your Christian name, your generational you know, Christian status, and uh, what you did for the church, and your good deeds, and this and that, I'm sorry, but that doesn't cut it. Not before the glorious judge, Jesus. No, no, no. Yeah, and before humans, it may cut it. <laughs> But if your confidence is solely on this glorious Jesus, then he's going to tell you what he told that uh, thief. 
the thief. He had no worthiness to actually go to heaven. He, all he said is, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus gives him the highest assurance. Today you will be with me in. The one who deserves no assurance and salvation only receives salvation and highest assurance. Everything is upside down in the kingdom. Point is what? The only way to face the judge is if the judge actually died for you. <laughs> if the judge actually loved you and died for you and gave his life for you and you believed it and you received him as savior. If you didn't receive him as savior, then you can't face him as judge. Are you ready to face him? Where's your confidence at? Are you confident? Are you not confident? Where are you? I think the ideal state is to really put your faith in Christ and Christ alone. That song we sing, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. In Christ alone. Ideal condition is you put your faith in Christ alone and your confidence is in Christ alone and you're sure of it and you're not worried and you're not afraid like the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy. Look at this. This is how you want to be. You don't want to be confident and miss it. You don't want to make it but live miserably in this life because you have no confidence. You want to be confident and make it. The Apostle Paul, look at his confidence here. 2 Timothy 4, 6, he's about to die. It's the last letter he writes. And he says in verse 7, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. What statements? Huh? He comes to the end of life and says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. If you live, you've got to live like this so that you can die like him. Look at verse 8. <laughs> Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. He says, now there is laid up for me. I'm going to die, he says. And what's waiting for me is a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. This is confidence bordering on what looks a little bit like, from one angle, arrogance. <laughs> from one perspective... You could think it's arrogance. Look at the way he says it. He says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Which judge is waiting to give somebody a crown? <laughs> He's saying the greatest judge, the most glorious judge, the righteous judge, I'm going to meet him. He has a crown waiting for me. <laughs> you see, Paul has no fear of, no kind of uh, unhealthy fear of judgment. He's confident that what is waiting for him is a righteous crown which the righteous judge will give him. And the confidence comes from, you know, previous verse. It comes from Christ above all. But it is also helped by a life that is lived for Christ. Isn't it? You see, one of the reasons we don't have assurance of our salvation is we don't, sometimes we don't have the life that matches with the, the claims. Like if we say we're a follower of Christ, we believe in Christ, sometimes our life doesn't uh, match up to it. We don't have enough transformation in our life sometimes. So that raises doubts, questions. We think we've lost our salvation or we're not even saved and, and we are doomed and all this. You know. So one of the reasons for our doubts and not being confident is the lack of a transformed life, the lack of living for Christ. But Paul, you see, he's, he's transformed. He's living for Christ. He can say, I finished the race. So all I'm saying is pursue a life that matches your faith. Pursue works that match your faith. Faith without works is dead. You believe in Christ? Great, excellent. Do you have a life that matches with it? If you feel like you don't, pursue it is what I'm saying. Desire, I'm sure you desire it. So, you know, pray about it and God will lead you to that. You see, it's a very tricky matter because like I said, some people are confident they shouldn't be and some people are not confident and they should be. <laughs> so it's important to get it right. I've preached a series on the assurance of salvation for nine weeks in 2019. It's available online. You can look it up and where systematically I deal with it for a sustained period. I can't do that now. All I'm saying is pursue a life that matches your faith, your faith confession and that itself will help you by God's grace, I believe you can live that kind of life and that itself will help you with being more confident. 
If you're confident about your salvation, you'll be confident about everything else. And you'll be confident throughout your earthly life. And, you know, go in that way. So, okay, next. We got to keep going. Last, finally, I think, we come to the fifth point. So, fourth point was, Jesus will return gloriously to judge the world. Are you ready to face him? Fifth point is, when Jesus returns, God will uh, restore all things and uh, cause us to live in a new heaven and a new earth. So look forward to it. Ah, this is where it's ending, right? After the judgment, you know, what awaits us finally is uh, a new kind of existence in a new kind of world. A world where everything is restored. All things have been restored. All things have been set right. All evil is turned into good. There is no evil, there is no sin, there is no suffering. Can you, can you imagine that kind of world? Just imagine it. It's so hard to imagine <laughs> because we've never seen anything like it. No evil, no sin, no suffering, no pain, no shame, no crying. That's the world that's described in Revelation 21, 1 to 5, right? I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21 verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. <laughs> this world as you know it is coming to an end. It's going to pass away. What is waiting for us, children of God, true believers in Christ is a new heaven, new earth. And uh, verse 4 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, crying. No more pain for the former things have passed away. Verse 5 says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Now you have to take some time in this earthly life to imagine. I'm just, I'm just saying take some time to now and then to, to think about that world you're going to live in. That existence. It's different and it's better. Everybody say it's different and it's better. That's very understated, I'm telling you. I'm being very, you know, it's the most understated manner I'm telling you. It's going to be vastly different and it's going to be better. It's going to be a huge upgrade. Now, yeah, there are some similarities. There will be an earth. It's not just we live in heaven, new heavens and the new earth. So there are similarities. We will have bodies, but there are differences. It will be a glorious body, you know. We will know one another, but it will be in different capacities and you know, use your imagination based on the Bible. <laughs> but people, see, when you start imagining, you look forward to that. God has that kind of a great existence planned for you. But people don't look forward. In fact, some people think they'll miss out on this and that here. You know. I heard somebody said uh, that uh, they really wanted to go to America in those days maybe. And so they prayed saying, it seems, Jesus, you know, before you return, I'd like to visit America. But uh, if you return before that, all I ask is that when you rapture me up, that you will at least swing me by America like that, you know, give me a quick <laughs> tour. <laughs> Another person prayed saying, you know, Jesus, you know, great that you're coming back, but before you come back, I want to get married and have at least one child, you know. <laughs> it's funny, but the thing is, the thought behind that is, we may miss out on something here. But no, if you understand what the Bible teaches about this new heavens and new earth and the new kind of world and the new existence, you will never miss out on anything. It is an existence, it's a life where you will not miss out on. You will never feel like you missed out on anything. It is going to be that much superior to this existence. If you look at a small child and try to teach, tell the child about the joys of marriage that uh, await it, it's not going to compute. If you tell a married couple... <laughs> Oh, in the new heavens and the new earth, there is no marriage. It's not going to compute. What they don't realize is God always has something way better, way better at the next stage. He's a God who does new things, greater things. Behold, I make all things new. It's going to be a world of love. Can you imagine living in a world of love? Every which way you turn, there is love. You know, God is always love and he's full of love. But the thing is, you in the new heavens and new earth, you will experience his love to the full. You will love him to the full and you will love others. 
with his kind of love. And they will love you with his kind. Can you even imagine that kind of world? If that's the, where we are going, then now itself we have to kind of start adjusting our lifestyle a little bit, don't you think? <laughs> Giving up some of the unnecessary jealousy, hatred, <laughs> unforgiveness. <laughs> because we're going to enter a world of perfect love. <laughs> it shouldn't feel totally strange to us when we get there. You know? <laughs> now itself we kind of have to start practicing a little bit. See, this world is full of hate and evil and jealousy and all that. But that world will be full of love. It will be full of uh, every good thing. It's an unimaginable kind of existence God has prepared for us. This is where we are going. Eh? We will be personally made glorious. The world will be made glorious. Eh? The lion will lie down with the lamb, the Bible says. Uh, it will be a world without any violence. and It's... Just, it's hard to imagine. But these things are taught in the Bible and it's going to come true. This is where it's going. These are the most important, some of the most important teachings about the end times I've laid before you today. There's no point in understanding, oh, you know, which year it's going to happen and which battle is what and this and all that. If these truths don't grip you, the kinds of things I've told you today. You see, if you realize God has this kind of future planned for you, this whole life you can live in a different way. Do you know that? If you know when you retire, you got a good setup going. <laughs> you got something very good set up. Then when you go to work itself, you'll go a little <laughs> charged, right? You won't go like, oh, what's the use of this job? What am I going to do? Finally, I can't save anything. Why? Well, nothing left, you know. You won't go with that attitude when you know you got some good, something really good set up for your retirement. It'll, you'll feel like doing your job itself better. <laughs> you'll be worry-free. You'll do what you want to do. You do because you like to do it, you know. If you got your future itself set up by God in the most glorious way, <laughs> if God has set up the most glorious future for you, if you really believe it, your whole life in this earth will be lived differently. Whole life can be lived differently. The problem is we don't look beyond this world and see. We don't look, we, don't, we just keep our head down, stuck in the present. Now and then we have to kind of look, live with one foot raised, you know. In that passage, Paul said, I am confident I'll receive the righteous crown from the righteous judge. And then he says, that is not only for me, but to all who love his appearing. To all who love his appearing. Oh, that, that's a thought I'd like to leave you with. <laughs> Are you longing for the return of Jesus? That's a most important question. That itself is a question which shows whether a person is a real believer or not. Right? It's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus. It's one thing to love Jesus and long for his return. Paul says, this crown is not for me alone, but for all who love, long for his appearing. You long for his return? <laughs> May we have hearts of love toward Jesus. May God lead us to love Jesus. You know, For everybody who loves his appearing, they can be confident. If you really love Jesus, you can be confident, you know. It's, it's important to be confident. It's important to not have unnecessary worry. When you are in the right place when it comes to this, you see. It's not so important whether you know every detail of end times. It's important to be longing for the return of Christ. The most important thing we should look forward is the return of Christ and to be with him forever. And uh, I pray that uh, God will lead us in that direction. Everybody, let's all stand up. Thank you, Father. We come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for these these things we just spoke about are, are realities, are great truths, Lord, having to do with our eternal future. And uh, we pray, we need your help to believe them, to understand them, to really live as though it's true, to actually let it make a difference in our lives. Today we pray, Lord, let it make a difference in the way we go and eat our lunch now. Let it make a difference in the way we rest this afternoon. Let it make a difference in the way we go to work tomorrow. Let it make a difference in the way we face our challenges and our problems. Help those who are going through all kinds of struggles to realize that it will all be soon made better. The sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to come. 
help them to put their faith in that ultimate perfect world that you have for them and then help them to realize that you are in the business of giving foretaste now you give glorious foretaste of the world to come now itself you make possible heaven on earth in our lives and even those of us who are living comfortable lives experiencing your good blessings help us to not be caught up and think this is all there is but help us to realize that this is only the foretaste of something much more grand and glorious that is coming and help us lord to think towards that end and and prepare ourselves to meet you lord thank you lord may love for you grow in every heart we pray by your grace by your power may you lead your people from now until all eternity for your glory in jesus name we pray Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us for now and forevermore. Amen.